Hello, I'm Dr. Preeti Malani, JAMA Associate Editor. I'm also the Chief Health Officer at the University of Michigan and a Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. I'm joined by three guests who recently published a series of viewpoints that describe a national strategy for COVID and the idea of a new normal as we enter the third year of the coronavirus pandemic. First, I have Dr. Zeke Emanuel, who is the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Zeke. Great to be here. Thank you. And then I have Dr. Michael Osterholm, who's the Director for the Center of Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, Mike. Thank you. And then finally, I have Dr. Luciana Borio, who's a Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome, Lou. Thank you so much, Preeti. It's so great to be here. So all three guests are deeply involved in policy efforts around the pandemic and have served as advisors to the Biden transition team from November 2020 to until January 2021. The three viewpoints were published online January 6th and are titled, A National Strategy for the New Normal of Life with COVID, A National Strategy for COVID-19 Testing, Surveillance, and Mitigation Strategies, and third, A National Strategy for COVID-19 Vaccine and Therapeutics. So thanks for joining me. I know it's been such a busy time. And if you had asked me last January what things might look like this January, I would have predicted that things would be a lot better in terms of COVID case numbers than they are certainly at this moment. But even as efforts are focused on getting us through the most recent surge, most public health experts feel that we are in fact marching towards endemicity. And that vision, the idea that transmission will eventually drop from the current very high levels, but COVID is not going away is the premise of these three viewpoints. What I'd like to do is explore some of the practicalities including how to operationalize some of the strategies presented. And the first viewpoint outlines the idea that we are moving from crisis to control, and the national strategy needs to be updated accordingly. Zeke, you and your co-authors write, infectious diseases cannot be eradicated when there is limited long-term immunity following infection or vaccination or non-human reservoirs of infection. The majority of SARS-CoV-2 infections are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, and SARS-CoV-2 incubation period is short, preventing the use of targeted strategies like ring vaccination. Even fully vaccinated individuals are at risk for breakthrough SARS-CoV-2 infection. Consequently, a new normal with COVID in January 2022 is not living without COVID-19. So tell me about the vision for this new normal, and practically speaking, how do we move forward? Well. I mean, I think the, the new there is supposed to emphasize we're not going back to 2019 where there was no COVID. We're going to be in a situation where COVID is going to be around us. It's going to be one of the multitude of respiratory viral illnesses that we face. And it's going to, you know, wax and wane just like flu does, just like RSV does, just like rhinovirus. Um, and so we need to take that into account. Getting there well, we're far from that situation at the moment with about 1,600 deaths a day, but getting there is going to require reducing transmission, and that's mainly going to be done through things like uh, air quality improvements indoors, wearing masks, and some vaccination to get the incidence level low. Then making sure people have fewer complications. That's partially the vaccines, which really are very, very good at reducing hospitalization and death, as well as the new therapeutics we have. Um, and then it's going to look, COVID really should begin looking like, you know, a flu. You get it, you stay home so you don't infect other people and your family. When you're feeling better, uh, you can go into work, probably wearing a mask for a few days uh, to, again, reduce the chance of infection. Um, and that is going to be more common. We're, we're, we're simply going to get back to uh, the life that we've known largely with some modifications. Thank you. So, Mike, the U.S. health system does a lot of things well, but public health is not at the top of that list. Yet rebuilding public health is a key aspect of the strategy described in the viewpoint. What can be done realistically to build the type of capacity you described and 
Is this something that should happen nationally or is it more likely to be successful at the state and local level? First of all, we have to understand that what uh, we have really seen happen over the course of the past two years is our healthcare system has been laid open publicly in a way people can see just the challenges we have in terms of providing care, of documenting uh, outcomes, and understanding how we bring those data together to make public policies that basically are primarily public health related and as well as treatment related. I think what really is the challenge here is we've lacked creative imagination to understand what a pandemic could do. Uh, you know, a year ago, as I think Zeke just pointed out and you did, most people thought that we were kind of out of the woods. Some of us said, well, with the variants, maybe we're not. Maybe the variants are going to give us some new challenges we hadn't anticipated. I'm not so sure that's not the case in the future. I hope it's not, but hope's not a strategy. And so I think that we still have to remind the medical care system there is that you provide on a day-to-day -day basis, and there's that you provide on a day-to-day -day basis during a crisis. And that includes public health. And so I think if nothing else, the silver lining, if there is one to this pandemic, is it gives us every reason to go back and reevaluate what are we doing with health care or disease care? What are we paying for? What are we not paying for that could make a difference from a public health standpoint? And so I, I find this is potentially either going to end up becoming a forgotten moment we just want to move on from, or it could be a renaissance moment in which we actually go back and ask ourselves these hard questions. And now the lessons learned are right in front of us. They're not imaginary. So to me, I think this is a very critical time to look at how do we improve the public's health. The final piece I would say, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, but I am very aware of all the adverse health outcomes that have occurred because we have deferred medical care. We have deferred many of our public health programs around the world, whether it be HIV or malaria, polio eradication. And the cost that's occurred there has been substantial. And so we're also gonna to have to understand how to rebalance public health back to a time when basically many of these issues were not forgotten like they have been during COVID. And do you think this could happen nationally or is it gonna be more of a local phenomenon? Well, I think it has to have national leadership, but as like with politics, all healthcare is local in a sense, even though it may be paid for by the federal government. And so I think what we have is a balance of how do we bring local related activities. And, and right now, I mean, look at uh, what's happening with our healthcare systems in terms of responding to all these cases of COVID. It turns out in the end, it's local. It's what assets and resources do you have? Which people do you have that can come to work today or can't come to work today? So I think it's going to be a combination of both. Uh, it can't be just a top-down. And surely the importance of resources and, and national planning are going to be critical for any local group or groups to come together and say, what is it that we can and should do so that this doesn't happen in the future? Great. Let's move on to the second viewpoint. And I'd like to delve into some of the suggestions outlined with respect to testing and surveillance. You know, a number of concerns come to mind and we clearly need a convenient, easy to access testing infrastructure that also links results to other important data. So the socio-demographics, vaccination status, and certainly clinical outcomes. But we're, uh, we're a long way from this. So Lou, what do you think testing needs to look like for this new normal? And in particular, how do you build a robust system to deal with the positive results that arise? Yeah, so that's, you know, that's the hard work. Sometimes we focus so much on developing the test, the vaccine and or the drugs, but linking uh, the assets we have, it's the challenge. And I envision that, first of all, I think it's remarkable that we have now um, a situation where people are able to do these very sophisticated tests at home um, and, and understand whether they might be infected or not. You know, that's remarkable. And I, don't, I don't see us going back. I think it's going to open up a lot of um, novel ways to diagnose diseases at home at the convenience of the home. And, but the, the key, the work of government, I'd say, is that they need to, you know, we have to develop the system around this so that we can adequately capture the data. And it may require some incentives. There must be an incentive to report the test, and then somebody's going to have to aggregate this data and create information from this data. Um, I think that, you know, in the near future, one of the great urgencies is to get the results of these tests and link 
them to an action, whether it's to isolation or whether it's to access to treatment as soon as possible, because we all know that having a result is just the beginning and not the end. Indeed, it'll be interesting to see how those systems are, are built in. Surveillance goes hand in hand with testing. Uh, so Mike, I'm gonna come back to you. You know, what does a comprehensive surveillance program look like in 2022? And you know, maybe you could talk about what would be ideal versus what is gonna be realistic. Well, we don't have to capture every case in disease surveillance to understand what's happening in our communities, both in terms of, of uh, the actual number of cases or the impact that it's having. But we've got to have a representative sample and hopefully most cases to really make that work. And right now, we have a system that is so broken. It's hard to believe, but there are health departments in this country that still receive their reports on disease ca uh, cases by fax machine. Right now, I have no oh, sense at all that the numbers we're getting are reliable in terms of case reports every day. I've been talking to state and local health departments around the country and some of the health departments are backed up thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of cases that have not yet been reported out over weeks and months just because of the backlog. And so one of the things we have to understand is big data means also something to public health in a way that most people don't think of when they think of clinical medicine. We've got to have a much better way to both document uh, who's infected when we do document it and then to be able to aggregate that quickly just like the clinical information. That has been a, a, a priority for public health for the last decade, and yet it has received little attention. And I think during this particular couple of weeks with Omicron, it's only become more accentuated. We've had to go to alternative measures to understand what's going on in our community. Number of hospitalizations, number of people on oxygen in hospitals, and then unfortunately even deaths. So I think the, the again, as we pointed out in the earlier discussion, now is the time for renaissance thinking as it relates to public health. What could we do if we had much more timely information and we had more accurate information? Uh, so this is going to be something that is going to be a combined effort of the federal, state, and local governments, and it's got to involve the private sector in a big way, particularly our healthcare systems around the country, who in the first instance are where most of these data come from. Thank you. So Zeke, in the viewpoint, you write about encouraging the use of N95s or KN95s rather than cloth or surgical masks. And you know, to me, masks have been really probably the most interesting part of mitigation. And if I think back to the beginning, the message was don't wear a mask, you know, save the masks. Even masks might transmit virus if you touch the mask. And then within a few weeks, I also remember in the hospital, healthcare workers going to universal masking and that was a really extraordinary thing because we were actually very low on personal protective equipment and uh, you know, using that mask felt uh, a little bit like a luxury. And we have learned that masks are in fact super effective when worn properly, especially with people around you are masked. But masks are also perhaps the most contentious aspect of mitigation, maybe even more than uh, vaccines. And there's some practicalities around distribution and training, but I just more simply, I just want to ask more simply, how do you get people to actually do this, especially when they won't wear a cloth mask? Do you think they'll use a, an N95? Well, look, I think this is a case of social norming. Uh, what is expected in society and what do you do? What are you doing as a responsible citizen? Unfortunately, this has become, as you point out, politicized and made a matter of a badge of culture, and that is the wrong way to look at it. Um, it really is, as you point out, protective. Uh, it reduces transmission substantially. Um, but in 2022, we have to be clear. Wearing an N95, KN95, KF94, those are the best masks, and they ought to supersede all others. How can we social norm that? Well, one thing I have suggested and we've suggested to the government is what if you sent out a voucher so people could go to a pharmacy or grocery and get uh, three, four, five of these masks uh, so that they could use them free of charge. That would certainly improve the thinking of the public around them. They would make them easily accessible, free, uh, and I think much more used. Um, I would say the other thing that's very good as a mitigation measure, which we have not heavily discussed, is indoor air quality. 
Um, we don't have an assurance that when we go into a building, the air quality is of a very high standard. Um, and if we are going to really uh, improve for the long term, as Mike points out, the public health around a respiratory viral illnesses, upping the air quality in indoors to MERV 13 or better is going to be really important. And in the interim, uh, people can use HEPA filters in school classrooms, in other public places uh, before uh, while we're in the progress, a process of getting these better uh, uh, fil uh, air filtration handling systems. Can I just make one other point, which is uh, to go to this issue of the healthcare system. One of the things that I think is very, very important um, is how we think about telemedicine. We are going to have these crises and these uh, workforce shortages in different places and the overwhelming of systems. Uh, one of the ways we can pretty much uh, not address all of that because a lot of medicine requires face-to-face -face contact, especially if you're doing procedures. Um, but there are a lot of things we can do via telemedicine that we have been resistant about adopting. You know, medicine across state lines uh, where people are, you know, li able to do it if they're licensed in a state, or making sure liability insurance covers it, making sure you're going to be paid for. But for many, many things, primary care, a lot of primary care, um, a lot of mental health, uh, we need to begin to make that standard and make permanent the changes we did around uh, the regulations for telemedicine. I think that'll help us relieve some of the pressures when a system gets overtaxed. So the third viewpoint focuses on vaccines and therapeutics. And again, as an infectious disease doctor, this is one that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this. And in the U.S. at this moment, nearly a quarter of the vaccine eligible population has still not had a single dose of a COVID vaccine. And that number has come down a little bit, uh, mostly due to the younger kids getting their first doses, but there's very, very little movement among adults who have not yet been vaccinated. And uh, Lou, regarding variant specific vaccines, you and your co-authors write, to reduce virus transmission and infections, next generation COVID-19 vaccines that match circulating SARS-CoV-2 variants need to be deployed Genomic surveillance coupled with nimble vaccine technology allow for rapidly adapting vaccines to emerging variants. And, you know, as I read this, vaccines based on the latest variants, they sound really great in theory, but to me, the reality feels different, at least right now. And, you know, again, the example that we are in at this moment in late November, we were still in the throes of a Delta surge. And, you know, within weeks, we're now seeing Omicron. Of course, we're not doing sequencing on everything. Uh, so, but again, who knows what is going to come next? And is variant vaccine something that we could do quickly and short term, especially during this phase of the pandemic where we're still having such large numbers of cases? Yeah, it's a really, you know, difficult to know right now because, you know, the future is a little bit unpredictable, but I think that it's important to be able to plan a parallel approach where we have, you know, plan for variant specific vaccines because they are the most effective against prevailing variants. You know, we have a lot of experience with influenza, for example. It, you know, should the virus become a more you know, seasonal virus? But we also need to pay attention to more broadly neutral, neutralizing or universal vaccines. Uh, for one, because you know, this is likely not going to be the next pandemic, and it's possible that we have another coronavirus surprise, and it would be really great to have vaccines that would work against um, you know, several types of coronaviruses, and, but also because we don't, you know, we can't predict completely how this virus will evolve. And, um, and but there are trade-offs, right? One type of vaccine is quite effective in preventing all infections in addition to severe disease and hospitalization, but very narrow in scope. Others that are broader, there may be trade-offs that may be very effective in preventing serious disease, hospitalization, and death but less effective in dealing with all infections and decreasing transmission. So at this moment, because there are uncertainties about how this is going to evolve, I think we need to go uh, full steam ahead with this parallel effort. Uh, and it's very important, again, for, the, for government, for the work of government, to help these companies establish a framework for how these decisions are going to be made. You know, who makes the decision about what variants should be included in, in the vaccine mix, or how are we going to track that? What are the uh, correlates of protection that would allow us to do a rapid uh, authorization for uh, a strain change, if you will? 
and uh, that work is ongoing. You mentioned the universal coronavirus vaccine, and you write about that in the viewpoint. Is this something that you think is likely in the near future, or do you have an estimated timeline on that? Oh boy, estimated timelines. You know, you're asking somebody who spent so many years at the FDA, <laughs> and I'll say they should be as fast as possible, but no faster than needed. Uh, you know, you have to be very careful because you know vaccines are given to to healthy people, and uh, we need to. And, and also, in fairness, what does it mean to have you know a universal vaccine? We know that it's not truly universal, but I think the science is there for us to develop vaccines that are very good at inducing cell mediated immunity and protecting us from you know the worst of this virus. And I think the science is there also to select the epitopes very carefully that will maximize uh, the desired impact. So you know th this the. the there's always a silver lining, right? I mean, I think that vaccinology has dramatically uh, progressed in the setting of COVID uh, because we were, you know, it was necessary to use all the tools in the box that we have in 21st century science. And I can't think of any other time recently that we had this, the, no, that this type of um, scientific effort around vaccines and immunology and manufacturing, et cetera. Uh, agree fully. And if you just step back and reflect on really what a, what a miracle of science the vaccines have been and the, the timeline and the safety and all the, all the surveillance uh, for adverse effects, it, it is truly one of, uh, of many several silver linings from a scientific standpoint. Well, I would say, I, I, I mean, pretty, I, you know, we, we should think about a year ago. A year ago, right, we just got the vaccines and they weren't deployed. Um, and we've got, you know, very effective, the most effective vaccines in the world. And we're in the midst of developing variant specific uh, uh, vaccines very rapidly in, in just a few months. We've got therapeutics, including oral therapeutics that we didn't have. We've got these lateral flow at-home tests, which we didn't have a year ago. I mean, there has been a lot of scientific and diagnostic progress. And sometimes I think in the midst of it, when we're confronting a million cases and 140,000 hospitalizations and 1,600 deaths, we often forget how much has changed over time. That doesn't mean, you know, we should pause and be congratulatory, sit on our laurels. We're still in the midst of a terrible pandemic. Uh, but um, we do need to appreciate the rapidity with which those things have come online. Yeah, I and mean, truly, it was uh, unimaginable in March of 2020. So this is really good to, to reflect on. Zeke, I want to come back to something that's more mundane, which is the <laughs> vaccine verification methods. And again, this is being used increasingly as an admission requirement to performances, athletic events, restaurants, and it's layered on mandates at workplaces and schools. And uh, do you think we'll move to a national uh, electronic vaccine certification platform? Um, <laughs> we've been resistant to it uh, <laughs> under a lot of pressure. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the resistance uh, to it. Uh, there are platforms out there in a number of states, but we have very, very good uh, certification systems up and running in states, uh, and they do work well. You're not required to, you know, get a uh, electronic certificate. Uh, you have to uh, access in and download the information. Uh, but uh, it is pretty secure because you have to use your phone, and only you have your phone. Uh, so I think there is uh, some hope that it'll be widespread, even if it won't be national. Yeah, and in, in a for people listening in, you know, I'd encourage you to take a look at the viewpoint. I think it was really laid out nicely in terms of the systems. And you know, having been on the other end of doing some of these vaccine verifications for our students, it is uh, it's very labor intensive, and it would be great if there was a an easier way. We agree. If I, could, can I add just? I think yeah. one of the important considerations here is not what is doable in the sense of science, but what is doable in the sense of everyday life. I, for one, would love to see uh, some kind of a system where we could know, in fact, what one's immunization or, for that matter, even if they've previously been infected, what their status is in terms of, of being protected. Uh, but I don't think that'll ever be a reality just because of the politics. Having served for 25 years in state and local public health, I kind of have a sense of what plays on the ground. This one will not play in Peoria. Uh, and, and so I think we've come to understand 
what that means. The same reason why we have governors today who refuse to put into place new mandates around uh, public events, masking and so forth, in the height of the Omicron, because they'll tell you they just can't do it. The public would not accept it. So I think we have to learn from that. We have to understand what that taught us about what we can and can't do and how we do it. I think the other piece of that is, though, and this is the humbling part about these vaccines. Remember last year when the vaccines first were approved, we were euphoric. We had these vaccines that were going to protect us 95% of the time, uh, two doses, uh, we were home free. And then we realized over time what happens with potential waning immunity and the potential need for additional doses of vaccine. Uh, we begin to understand more and more about challenges of what is protection. If you have been previously infected, what does that mean? And so I think, uh, in a sense, this is a moment of great humility also, where we have to say we still have some really major unanswered questions about what can a vaccine do for us? How often do you have to be vaccinated? Everyone on the, I think on this screen would agree, if we ended up having to vaccinate people multiple times a year, which I'm not suggesting will be the case, but at least some are hinting towards that, that is simply not doable for the world. It would set up an incredible double standard that I don't think would ever be allowed. More importantly, look at the fact that we almost have two thirds of those individuals who have received two doses of vaccine they're surely not vaccine hesitant or vaccine hostile who've not gotten their recommended third dose. Why? You know, we have more and more data showing the improvement in outcomes with that third dose versus the first two, particularly against now against Omicron. So I think part of the sociology of this issue, the psychology of this issue, is almost as important as the immunology or the data uh, driven uh, questions we have. And I don't see right now that that's there, but I think this is another important part of how we evaluate what we've been through with this pandemic. Yeah, those are great reflections, Mike. I, I think it, it gets back to that notion too, that the vaccinations are really about protecting everyone around us, not just a intervention to protect us. And uh, that has also gotten lost sometimes, although they yeah. do protect us very well too. And Preeti, I'd like to add that, you know, we have about 25 million children under five years of age in this country and about 7 million people that are living with immunocompromising conditions, right? So even yeah. though we like to be able to move to the new normal as soon as possible, I think that one of the barriers to get in there is the fact that we have people that yet cannot access vaccine yet, and there are people that despite being vaccinated, they do not mount a protective immune response. Yeah. So until we have you know, ample supply of effective therapeutics, uh, a way to link uh, testing to diagnosis to therapeutics that is going to slow us down to feeling like you know this is this is now a new normal yeah for sure and that's a great segue to the last topic i want to talk about which is oral therapeutics and this is another place where we've seen great progress and you know i think in the long term i am really hopeful that these agents will help yeah. decrease the risk of hospitalization and death in those medically vulnerable patients especially and for monoclonals, we've been doing this for more than a year with a lot of success. And there is new, there are new data to support outpatient remdesivir use. That's a little harder because of the logistics. And of course, just in the last few days, oral antivirals are starting to become available. But the demand is super high. And right now, supply and resources for administration are limited. So not just the supply, but the actual physical ability to get these uh, therapeutics to people. So my last question is really about how to make this work. Now, these therapeutics are most effective, as we know, early. So you need early testing, you need to connect people. So how do we do a better job, just from a practical standpoint right now, linking the COVID-19 testing systems with an eye on equitable allocation of these limited resources? And Lou, I'll start with you, and then maybe the others can add in some of their thoughts. This is something that, we, you know, the three of us and uh, the six of us, actually, the advisors have talked extensively about, and it will be very important, I think, as we move forward to make sure that there is access that is facilitated, whether it's at the infusion center that somebody can self-refer upon a positive diagnostic test. If they meet criteria, they should be able to self-refer and get um, assessed and treated right there without you know, having this need to go through a physician um, that frankly, you know, this has taken a lot of time right now for patients, even when the drugs were in more ample supply, the monoclonals, it sometimes several days elapsed 
between a patient being diagnosed and then being referred to an infusion center. So I think that's the key, of course, in addition to increasing supply significantly. You know, if I could just add a, a piece here of perspective, uh, you know, we've all on the screen here remember, unfortunately, very painfully, those early days in the 1980s when an HIV diagnosis was, in essence, a death sentence. Today, we know that we can do amazing things with therapeutics to make HIV much more a long-term chronic condition. And that ability to do that can't be lost on what I think can happen with COVID and the SARS-CoV-2 type illnesses on a global basis. If we could do, just as Lou just pointed out, and we can do it if we put our minds to it, understanding with that creative imagination of just how different the world could be with a one-two punch of vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, you know, we could do, I think, a tremendous amount to reduce serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. And what more could we want for? So I, I think that this is an exciting time coming up. It's our opportunity. If we miss it, people will die unnecessarily and we will continue to deal with the social, economic, and political fallout of this disease. If we do it right, we can do so much to bring this horrible virus under better control. I mean, one of the things it seems to me that would work well, and it's not going to be stood up overnight, but, you know, we need a system where someone who tests positive, initially it'll be PCR, but then hopefully we can get the at-home test linked too, um, if they test positive, they get a robocall that tells them how they can get the therapy or the number to call, um, as well as how they should isolate themselves, the mask wearing, what they need to do to take care of themselves. That's not impossible, right? When you go in, at least I recall when I got <laughs> vaccinated or, uh, or tested, I had to leave a telephone number and I had to leave a, a uh, uh, email. And we could automatically, I mean, without human intervention, you got a positive, you get not just the result, but information about how to get the therapy as well as what to do in the interim to protect yourself. We haven't built that infrastructure. It's not complicated. You know, we know that. Lots of companies bombard you with emails or, or uh, texts um, with relevant information. And I think that would be enormously helpful. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, again, I think this is one where different states are doing it differently. In Michigan, there is an effort to try yeah. and provide these antivirals at point of care with testing. I, I hope that we can get to the point where we are able to scale this with our community pharmacy partners sooner than later. So thank you for this great conversation. And thank you also for the work all of you continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us.